Okay, on to part two. And this is going to be taking that bouncing ball uh, a little bit further with a little bit more control. So in order to get that control, we're going to need to do a little bit of setup. Um, this isn't really going to be creating a rig for it because it's not going to use any armatures or any bones. Um, but it kind of is. We're just going to use some empties. So start, I'm going to hit A to select everything. A, X, delete. I'm also going to turn on my screencast keys so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. Okay, we're done. Let's make sure those are on. Um, yeah, so first thing we need to do is add our sphere. So uh, 3D cursor is still in the center. If it isn't, hit Shift C, that'll center your cursor. Shift A, and we're going to add in a UV sphere. And so we're going to use, we're going to have translation, rotation, and scale on this sphere. And I'm going to shade it smooth. If I start rotating this, just double tap R, you can't really tell that it's rotating. So to fix that, I just a couple of quick materials. Create a new material. I'm also, this is a new scene, we'll make sure I'm on cycles. Create a new material, set the base color, that's the only thing I'm going to change. Um, I know I've been doing a lot of pink and teal recently, uh, but why stop now? Okay, so we'll start the, set the base color as that, and uh, I can either go into hit Z and go to Material Preview, or in Solid View I can just hover over the color, Control C to copy it and then scroll down to my viewport display and paste it there and now you'll see it in solid view as well I don't usually do this um, but in this instance it's helpful then I'm going to tab into edit mode, hit 1 to go into front view and Z um, wireframe and hit 3 to select faces and I'll select middle faces. I'm going to hit the plus in the materials to add a new material slot like we did last week. New and this will be that hot pink because I've been on an 80s kick recently and why not. So I've got my hot pink base color. I'm going to copy that into my viewport display. Uh, tab back into object mode, Z to go into solid view. And I forgot to do one thing so I'll go back in edit mode. I forgot to hit assign. So click assign, and there we have it. Now we have something that we can tell when it's rotating. So you can texture obviously however you want, but that's how I chose to do it. Okay, so we've got that. Now I'm going to move this up one unit so that it's sitting on the grid floor. All right. And this time I will add a ground plane. I'm going to edit mode and just scale it. Uh, I scaled it by 20. I'm going to double that again. That'll be fine. And we'll call this ground. And then this can still stay. Well, call it ball. Very descriptive names, I know. Alright, so we have that. You know, one to go into front view. And now we need to start adding our controls in. So let me jump over here. So I got my notes. Uh, make sure I get this order right, because it does matter what order you do this in. The sphere selected. I'm going to hit Shift A. Oh, make sure I'm in Blender. There we go. Shift A. I'm going to add an empty, and I'm going to choose the sphere empty. It's going to give me this wireframe thing. And it adds it at the base because that's where my 3D cursor is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the sphere, uh, Shift S to snap my cursor to selected, and grab my empty, Shift S, selection to cursor. And now it's in the right spot. I'm going to go over to my empty properties here, and I'm going to just adjust the size a little bit just so it's outside the sphere. And then 
I'm going to double click in the outliner and call this rotate. If you double click and it doesn't let you um, rename it, you can also just hit F2 or right click and uh, I guess you can't rename it there. I thought rename was there. Oh well. Um, yeah, F2 will also rename it. Okay, so I have that rotate empty selected. And now I'm going to select the sphere first, hold down shift and select the empty. And then I'm going to parent it. So control P, set parent to object to keep transform. The outliner, you see the, the ball disappears, so we just click this little drop down arrow. You see the ball is still there. Now the ball is a child of the rotate empty. Okay, so now if we rotate this empty, the ball follows it. Okay. Uh, now I have my 3D cursor centered on the sphere, which is where I want it. Uh, now we're going to add the next empty. So Shift A, and I'm going to add a cube here. And my empty properties here. We can just click and drag and scale that up a little bit. I'm going to hit one to go into front view. Scale that up just a little bit. Okay. I'm going to name this scale. Okay. That works. And now I'm going to select the rotate empty first. Hold down shift. Select the scale empty. Control P. Set parent to object to keep transform. Okay, expand that out again. You can see the rotate is now a child of the scale. And then finally, one more empty. Uh, for this, I'm going to add it on the ground. So I'm going to hit Shift C to recenter my 3D cursor. We'll zoom back in here. 3D cursor is now at the world origin. Shift A, add empty, and this time it's just going to be a circle. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees around the X axis. And then we can scale it up as well. Whatever works for you. Okay. So, there's our empties. I'm going to now um, complete the parent relationship. So, I'm going to select the scale empty first. I'll down shift, select. Let me hide the ground here because that's in the way. Scale empty, shift, select the move empty, control P, keep transform, rename this to move. Okay, so here's my hierarchy. I have the ball is a child of the rotate, is a rotate, is a child of the scale, is a child of the move. Now you might be asking yourself, why the heck are we going through all of this trouble when we can just move, rotate, and scale the ball itself? Um, and that is because when we start rotating this ball through the air, as it's falling towards the ground, we're going to want to stretch it a little bit. But if you try to stretch and rotate the same thing, it's going to be falling and tumbling, and that's not really what we want. We want it to con consistently stretch in one direction, and then rotate it, uh, rotate around the Y, and keep that stretch going in the same direction. So that's why we went through this little this little setup here. So it's not going to be perfectly phys physically accurate. It's not going to maintain volume um, as we scale, but it'll be good enough for kind of our cartoony purposes here. Um, next thing to to set this up is just to help make it so that we don't accidentally move the wrong thing or scale the wrong thing. If we go to the object properties here in this transform, which we've seen and that's what we were kind of animating off of before, uh, we have this little lock icon and that's going to allow us to lock some of the values so that we can't change them. So we're going to start with the sphere, the ball, right? and I'm just going to lock all of these values. So I'm just going to left click and drag and I can drag and, and adjust all of them, so I don't have to necessarily click individually. Um, if your mouse goes a little crazy and you accidentally select these, it's going to add keyframes. You can just click on them again and get rid of them. So now, in the viewport, if I select the ball and I hit G to move, you can see it's not going anywhere, which is what I want. 
And I'm going to select the rotate empty, and I'm going to lock the location, and I'm going to lock the scale. So now, I can if I hit S, I can't scale it at all, but I can still rotate it. Do the same thing for this scale. I'm going to lock lo location and rotation, and then. Um, I mean, I could even get more more picky with the scale and, and lock it so that I could only scale it in the Z direction if I wanted to. Um, it's up to you. Maybe I'll keep it on. Um, that's Yeah, it just depends on how limiting you want to be. And then we have the move. So we can lock rotation and scale and just focus on location for that. Okay. Okay, uh, at this point I'm going to save this. We'll call this Bouncing Ball Demo 2. Click Save. You get one to go into front view. And we're, we can start blocking in our animation. This is going to start much the same way that we did the last one. Uh, I am going to temporarily hide the scale and the rotate. I'm just going to worry about the move at this point. Okay, so uh, I'll move my view over here. And we're going to start at 10. I'm going to hit, uh, we'll just turn on our automatic keyframes, and I'll hit I and add a location keyframe. There we go. So I had to, after I turned on auto keyframe, I still had to hit I and, and add a keyframe, because once I turned on auto keyframing, I hadn't moved it yet. I moved it before and it didn't count that until I turned it on. So that's why I had to manually add that first keyframe. So that's in my starting point at frame one. I'm going to move, I'm just going to go 10 frames at a time right now. And this is going to move down, or it's going to move over and it's going to move down. So let's go and we'll say maybe four units over. Once I get it in position, I can fine tune it and set dial in z, z to zero so I know it's on the ground. Although we want to add some squash and stretch and when it hits the ground, obviously it's going to squash. Um, actually, so I was going to say we can just move this below the ground and then when we start squashing it, we'll squash it so that if I turn my scale back on, You can scale it down until that's sitting on the ground here, right? And that definitely works. That um, There's no reason why that wouldn't work. Uh, but what I was thinking is instead of it squashing to the center, I'll set this back to zero. I turn the scale back on. With my, um, I'm going to turn off auto keyframing here for a second. I don't think it's going to mess anything up, but I want to take a chance. With my move empty selected, I'm going to hit Shift S and snap my cursor to the selected. Okay, now I'm going to select my scale empty. Go to Object, Set Origin to 3D Cursor. And, uh, did that work? It didn't seem to work. I wonder... I wonder if it needs to not be apparent. Hmm. Okay. It uh, doesn't matter. We can do it. We can do it the other way. I'm just needlessly complicating this thing. So I want to go back into front view. I'm going to hide that scale again. I'm going to hit Shift C to get that out of the way. Uh, and yeah, so like I said, this is going to bounce and squash, so we're going to move this down a little bit. I don't want to go too far. I definitely want to go past halfway. Maybe something like that. Okay. So uh, now we'll move 10 frames down. And we'll go maybe over here. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to turn on my motion paths. That's okay. So I can kind of get a sense of, of where I'm coming from, where I'm going. 
Uh, so we'll move over. I think we'll go about six units up. I'm not going to type in six exactly. I don't need to be that precise with it. Something like that. See, I turned off my uh, auto keys, so hit I and hit look route scale, insert a keyframe, and click update paths. You can see how that adjusts. And again, we haven't messed with the graph editor at all, so we're going to see this easing in or yeah, easing in at the bottom. So we'll fix that later. Uh, all right, I'll move another 10 frames down. Bring this, and I want it not quite as far down as it was back on frame 10. So on frame 10, our Z value. Oh, I didn't have auto keyframing set, so I'll move it down. And we'll go to about here, something like that. So about a half a meter below. And then here, I don't want to go quite so far. I'll go to about 0.3. Something like that I think will work. All right, I'll keep going. 10 more frames. And we'll go something like that. 10 more frames. that. Like that. Oh. Don't forget to move your frame before you add a new keyframe. Something I forget to do all the time. Again, I'm just blocking it in so I don't have to be exact with any of this. that and then when it's done bouncing I still want it to roll for a little bit. So I'll go to frame 140. Just move it along the x-axis. Something like that. Okay. Make sure we update the paths, make sure we're, we're looking good. Uh, so this end frame is going to be 140 so I'll set the end here to 150 so it takes a pause before it restarts and we'll hit space. Okay. So before I do any of the um, scaling or the rotating, let's fix this animation first and then we can add uh, some additional uh, accents. So, I'll split my view again and go to the graph editor. Alright, so now we have, if we expand this out, I'm going to turn off all my rotation and scale. We can also turn off the Y location because we're not animating that. Um, we have this X location which doesn't look great, but we'll fix that here in a second. And we have our Z location. So let's start with the Z location. I'm going to turn off my motion paths for now. And I think actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to merge these back together and I'm going to split the view from the bottom. And so from here, I'll set this to the graph editor. Just kind of works a little bit better for what we're doing. And so we can kind of play this back and see, make sure that we're going to see the whole thing, and we are. We are. Okay. So the first thing, the uh, same thing that we did before, is I want to select all of these bottom keyframes, and I'm going to hit V and set the handle type to free. Okay, so now what I can do is go in and start playing with the curves and get something that is a little bit more realistic. 
See, this needs to move up just a little bit more. Move this one over to about here. And there. You see, again, the, the 10 frame spacing here works at the beginning, but it's not going to work at the end when the bounces are much shorter. It shouldn't take the same amount of time to bounce this much as it does to bounce this much. Okay. And for this, if you, you can't get a good sense of, of how things are behaving, uh, you can hold down control, middle click and drag up, and then you can get a better sense of how these are going. So maybe I'll scale that up a little bit. Okay. So select everything, hit number pad period to frame it up. Uh, so let's hit play and see what it looks like now. Okay. So that first bounce has a lot of energy. And then the second bounce really pauses up there for a second. We're also getting this weird kind of uneven speed going left and right, and that's because our X graph here is just terrible. So we're going to select, hit A to select everything, number pad period again, and now we can see our graph. Um, and as we remember how to read this graph, you can see that it's accelerating because it's getting more vertical, and then it slows down, and it's a little bit wavy the whole way through until it finally tapers out at the end. Um, really, it's going to maintain speed right up until it starts rolling, for the most part. Um, so to simplify this, I'm going to select all these middle keyframes, hit X and delete them. Okay. So now it's going it, to... it starts slow and then it speeds up, which also isn't quite accurate, and then it slows down. And we're going to add the roll at the end, so this will not feel like a slide, it'll feel like a roll. Um, but we want continuous speed at the beginning, and so to achieve that, I'm going to select that first keyframe, hit V, and set my handle type to vector. So now it's going to be pretty constant speed until, uh, until we get towards the end, and then it'll slow down. Okay, so let's watch that again. Okay, that's feeling a lot smoother. Not quite there yet, but it's it's feeling a lot better. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to my Z location. We can kind of look at that. Um, I want to take a second and look at the heights, the relative heights here. Oh, there we go. Let's hit the wrong key. I want it decaying or the same percentage each time. So if we're going from 10 down to 6, okay, so we're going to 60% 60, uh, 60 of the original, or a little bit more than half if you don't want to get too mathematical about it. So from 6, then this should go down to about probably a little over 3.5. Uh, and I'm not quite there. So if I left click and drag from the timeline and bring it down, I can kind of see where I'm at. But I want to go and hit G to move this keyframe, and then a Y to just move it vertically. I'm going to move it. I'm keeping an eye over on the right side of my uh, frame in the in the object properties. I'm going to go to about three and a half or so, maybe three point four. Okay. So this is what I'm keeping an eye on for my values. And then let's move over to the next one. So we're going from three and a half. Half of that is going to be 1.75. I want to go a little bit more, so maybe I'll go to like just shy of two. GY. Maybe something like that. And then from here We'll go to just over one. Eh, maybe a little less. And then from here, I'll go to like 0.4. Okay. So I'll take care of that part of it. Now, as I made those adjustments, 
just want to check and make sure that I didn't the auto keyframing didn't add any extra keyframes to my X axis and it didn't so we're good all right so we have our heights in the right spot I like how that's decaying um, but you, as you can see as the bounces get smaller it feels more floaty and that's because it's it's taking too long in the air at those points so to adjust this I can do it on the timeline just fine um, but I do want to show another editor and that's going to be the dope sheet so I'm going to change this here to the dope sheet the dope sheet is like the timeline but more um, and so just a really quick how to read this we have the summary and the summary is is basically the timeline it's if there's a keyframe for any object in your scene anything at all uh, it'll show up here in the summary and then below that in this it's a hierarchy it's like the outliner kind of we have the move object which is the object that I have selected and then the move object we have actions you can have multiple actions um, animation actions for an object we're not gonna worry about that uh, but in that action we have these transforms and then if I expand that out you can see my X my Y my Z values and everything else okay so if you wanted to um, you know only move the keyframes for the let me deselect only move the the keyframes for the Z rotation you can do that and when I select those you can see that it's also selecting these keyframes because it's it's selecting it's basically telling me that I'm selecting something that is in the move object that is in the summary so if I want to select everything I can just click on the summary on the top level or I can get really specific about what I'm selecting okay now what I want to do here I, I feel pretty good about the first couple of bounces but I think around here is where it starts to feel slow yeah I think 30 to 50 is when it first starts to feel kind of slow so one thing that I can try is I'm going to select all of these keyframes let's click and drag across and I'm only click click uh, excuse me only clicked and dragged across the summary because that will select everything below it and I'm going to with my playhead at 30 I'm going to hit S to scale and it's going to scale towards that playhead if you remember the closer two keyframes are together the faster that transition happens the faster that animation happens the further apart the slower it is so I want to speed it up so I'm gonna scale it down uh, let's go to like there maybe we'll see how that feels there's gonna be a lot of kind of making adjustments playing it back seeing how it feels actually I think it was pretty good one two three okay so I think even the third one feels pretty good Um, but these can probably scale in a little bit more so we'll scale those a little bit further mm. I want to make sure this is, is doing it in a relatively even way so I'm just gonna manually move this is going from 47 to 56 so that's nine frames 47 56 and then it's 56 to 64 so that's only eight frames so I'm gonna move this one two okay so now it's 47 to 54 that's seven frames and then I'm gonna move all of these just one so now that gap from 54 to 61 is also seven frames we'll play that back see how that feels pretty good this hit doesn't quite feel right I'm gonna jump back to the graph editor ah yeah I was saying that hit didn't feel like it was had enough impact so I'm gonna rotate these handles out try to give that more impact now, I still need to adjust the timing on those but while I'm here I'll take a look at these as well 
Okay. We'll jump back to the dope sheet. And you can you can split your view multiple times um, and have kind of everything there. I'm just jumping back and forth between the graph editor and the dope sheet here just to keep the interface a little bit simpler for you um, so you can see it and not get too overwhelmed with a bunch of different windows and menus open at, at any given time. So uh, these were seven frames. I'm going to go maybe, let's see what five frames looks like for the next gap. So from 61, that's going to be to 66. And then to 71 for these. That feels pretty good. And then I think we'll maybe go like, maybe we'll do like three frames here. So 71, so it's going to be 74. And then 77. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of math, but we'll get through it. All right, so. All right, that looks all right. It probably is a little bit of tweaking, but for the sake of this not being hopefully a full hour video, um, I think we'll move on. But we will jump back to the graph editor. And, okay, you can see our handles here are weird again. Hit G to move this. I'm going to bring it down and out. And over. And again, I'm looking for a nice smooth arc there. And then this is just all sorts of a mess, so bring that in there and there. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Hit play one more time. At this point, our animation is ending about frame 102. So I'm going to change my end to 120. And then at the bottom here of the timeline, I'm going to grab this little handle here and drag that in and just expand it out so I can kind of zoom in on my timeline. All right, and then shift left arrow to jump to the frame frame one. Hit spacebar. Yeah, that's feeling pretty good. Um, if I was being really picky, I'd probably add in one more micro bounce right here. But again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to. Um, so I'm, I'm happy with the move uh, animation. I'm going to hide that. I'm also going to hit save so I don't lose all of my hard work. And my computer will think about it for a minute. For some reason. Probably because I'm screen recording. There it goes. Alright, I will... Uh, I already hid my move controller. So now I'm going to turn on my scale. And... We're going to start right here. So I'm going to select the scale. And what we want to do is, uh, if you remember with the scale, I've locked all of the transforms except for scaling in the Z direction. So all I have to do is hit S and scale. And we're just going to scale it down until the bottom of the sphere is on the ground. Okay automatically added a keyframe for me. Now, the problem is that's the only keyframe I have. And if I move back, you can see it starts squashed and, it, and, and you know we'll make those adjustments later. But we don't want that. So I'm going to go back like three frames. We'll try three. We might make an adjustment. And I want to get rid of that scale. So I can either go over here to the properties, type in 1 and fix that, or go to Object Clear Scale. You see the shortcut there is Alt-S. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit Alt-S, clear that scale. It's going to set that keyframe. And we can focus here just on the adjustments we're making. These aren't going to be very extreme adjustments, so we can zoom in here. Alright. So now it's going to start at its normal shape. And then when it hits the ground, it squashes. But in the couple of frames before it, it's squashing early. It's anticipating it in a way that we don't really want. Um, anticipation is a part of good animation. It's one of the 12 principles, but this isn't really how we want to anticipate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back just one frame. And here... I'm going to scale it a little bit past 1. So it's going to stretch a little bit. Say maybe 1.2. Alright, it's going to feel a little bit cartoony, but it's going to help bring some life to it. Okay. So when we do that, 
zoom in here a little bit. And I'll go back to frame one, and I'll hit play. Okay, so it's falling, it's falling, it's going to stretch a little bit as it picks up speed, and then right before it's stretched, and the next frame, it squashes into the ground. Okay, and then we need this to scale back up. And I'm going to go again past 1 a little bit. So 1.42. Okay, so not quite as stretched as it was before, but still pretty stretched. And then I'll go another 2 frames maybe. Hit Alt S to clear the scale. So it's back to normal. Okay, so now I'm going to hit play. I'm going to turn off the, the manipulator here. So we can see that maybe a little bit better. It's it's very difficult to see. It's almost imperceptible. But you, you feel it. You don't necessarily see it. So shift left arrow, go back to frame one. Okay. Uh, we can also try. If I go in here to my properties, I'm going to set the frame rate to a custom, we'll say, 12 frames a second. It's just going to slow it down a little bit so you can get a better sense of, of what that's doing. Okay. Now we can we can play around with this as as far as when that anticipation happens when it starts changing. Um, we can try just to experiment. We can try moving this stretch frame. Right, this frame. We can try moving this back. G X minus one. Move it back one frame. Let's see how that feels. Uh, again, I'm going to go full screen. Oops, let me turn off the scale again. Shift left arrow to go to frame one. Okay, that feels a little weird in uh, in full screen. But let's go back to 24 frames a second. Back to frame one. I think it's probably anticipating a little too soon. But I know it's happening really fast and, and can be difficult to see. Again, it's, it's something that you kind of feel more than you necessarily directly observe. So I'll move that back over one. You can also try move, maybe moving both of these. Yeah. I think we'll keep it like that. Okay, so once we have that, we can jump over to the next one, do a similar thing. That's just probably not as extreme because it's not falling from as high a height. So, we'll zoom in here, we'll scale it down until it, the bottom of the ball is just touching the ground. Okay. Then we'll go back two frames. And we're going to Alt S to clear the scale. And we'll scale up just a little bit. Or go back here so I can see what my values are. And I can compare. I can see, okay, what was this stretching? This was stretching into 1.14, 1.19. 1 so maybe like 1.12. Just a little bit. And I'll go two frames before that, Alt S, and clear the scale. Okay, so we've got a flat line, so we're, we're staying at the normal scale, and then it stretches a little bit before it hits the ground, a little anticipation. Then it hits, and okay, those both happen too soon, so I'm going to select them both. G1 to move them one frame over. Scrub through. There we go. About two frames passed, and we're going to scale it up. One point. Then we'll just do an even 1.1, 1 .1, something like that, maybe a little less. Okay. And then another couple of frames, Alt S, clear the scale. All right, so I'm going to pause it. I'm going to go through and, and do this for the rest of them. Uh, and then we'll come back and uh, see the result. Okay, so I did the last uh, couple of bounces. The only real thing of note is that you can see uh, down here on the timeline the gaps between the keyframes got narrower. It's because the, again the bounce, the bounces are shorter. Uh, there's less energy. The uh, 
um, space between them doesn't need to be as long. So let's look at the result. I'm going to turn off my manipulator here, hit the space bar. Okay, that's feeling like it's got pretty good life to it. And again, you could exaggerate this even more if you wanted to go super cartoony with it. You could kind of dial it back. Um, it all depends on what style you're going for, what the material is, um, all that. So, uh, we're pretty good with the scale. Uh, let's jump to uh, rotation. So I'll turn on my rotate handle. And this is a pretty easy one. We're more or less going to mirror the graph that we did for X translation, X move. So I'm going to go to frame 1. And I'll select that. Or, oops, select my rotate empty. Hit I and set a rotation keyframe. And then we're going to go to our end frame, which, if we can't remember what that is, um, we can just switch this to the dope sheet here, real quick. Dope sheet and. Right now, if I unhide everything, you can see all the keyframes popping up. And the dope sheet, like, much like the graph editor, you can click this little button right here, which will only show you what you have selected. Uh, but I want everything visible so I know where my last frame is, which is frame 102. Okay. And now I can hide my other manipulators. And I'm going to rotate this forward. It's going to be rolling forward. And it doesn't really matter what the number is. We can try, I don't know, 1403. Why not? Okay. So we've got that set, and we're going to hit space and play that. And you see it's rotating. Uh, let's look at the graph editor here. And we'll hide all the things that we're not changing. We're only really rotating around the y-axis. Hit A to select everything in number pad period. So here's our graph. Um, and we can see that the rotation is speeding up and then it slows down again. It's that default Bezier curve profile. Uh, so I'm going to go back to, f to frame one. I don't even have to move the playhead, but I'm going to select that first keyframe and I'm going to hit V to change my handle type and go to vector. So it's going to start in a straight line. It's going to be constant rotation and then towards the end it's going to slow down. And that actually feels really good. Sometimes you might notice uh, towards the end here, it might feel like it's sliding. All right. So if I go to this last frame and I change this from 1403 to, I don't know, let's say like 3000 and then hit play, it's spinning a lot more there and then it, it feels a little bit slippery. It almost feels like it's on ice because it's rolling faster than it's moving. Okay, we can even make that more extreme. Let's go to 5,000. Okay, and just watch that end part. Okay, it's definitely, it feels like it's spinning its wheels. Um, and that's because the rotation isn't really matching up with the motion. So I may have gotten a little bit lucky. Oops, I was on the wrong frame there. I may have gotten a little bit lucky with the value that I chose. But it's a good thing to definitely watch for. That's feeling really good. So, um, I'm going to turn off that and I'll hit control space to maximize this view. And here is our more animated bouncing ball with some squash and stretch, some rotation, a little bit of roll at the end. Um, this takes time, just you might have to do it a, a few times to really get a feel for it. And lucky for you, being in this class, uh, the homework is going to be to do this three times with three different types of balls. So um, pick three, it doesn't matter which ones, maybe one is like a super ball, one is a racket ball, maybe one is a bowling ball, um, you know, a soccer ball, marble. Just pick three different spherical objects that you can bounce 
Uh, they need to be moving horizontally and vertically, bouncing, squash and stretch. Um, for at least two of them, need to have squash and stretch. Rotation. And then I'm going to throw a curveball at you as well. No pun intended. Um, so this was the easy version of this because there's nothing else in the scene. It's just the ball bouncing on the ground. Uh, for yours, I want to also add a cube, move this up a little bit. Okay. Oops. I want you to have a wall, and I want the ball to be bouncing off that wall. So I'm going to save this again. I'm going to save this as a new version. Just to kind of give you a quick idea of what I'm looking for. So, as this is bouncing, let's say on this second bounce, like right here, is maybe where it hits the wall. So I'm on a front view. Okay. So when it, when it hits the wall here, what happens? How is this going to behave? So a couple things you need to think about. Uh, there's probably going to be a little bit of squash and stretch here. All right, so I'm going to take my scale. I'm going to unlock my scale in the x direction. All right, and there's going to be S X. I'm going to scale it down a little bit, and we'll go back a bit. Mm. Go back one frame, and we'll clear that. Oops, clear that scale. So it's going to bounce off of it. But when it bounces off of it, that next frame is no longer going to be forward, right? I also need to uh, delete my other keyframe here. Don't need that wall moving around. Okay. So once it hits, where is it going to go? Well, in the x direction. The, the vertical direction isn't really going to change. But it is going to bounce back this way. Okay? It's going to hit. And I think I... Oh! I see what happened. The wall's in the wrong spot. should be there. And then this should be over here. Okay, so it's going to hit, and it keeps moving on me, and I'm not entirely sure why. Actually, I think I have an, I think I have an idea why. It's probably easier to do this from scratch and not try to modify an existing animation. This should be here. Okay. There we go. It's going to hit. All right. Oh, that's the problem. I need to set a keyframe for it. Lo uh, location. There we go. And then it's going to bounce back. Okay. And so what you need to consider is how is this bounce going to affect the direction? All right, I'm going to bring up my grease pencil. And bring up my grease pencil uh, options here somewhere. I never use a grease pencil. Um, if we draw this in. Okay, so the ball's coming this way. I mean, eventually gravity's going to start taking it. It's going to hit the wall, and then it's going to bounce off. And it's going to bounce off this angle here. If we draw kind of a line straight through, this and this are going to be the same angle. Or this angle and this angle are going to be the same. So if that ball is bouncing from this angle, okay, and let's say this is, I don't know, maybe it's 40 degrees, 
then it's going to bounce off. We'll kind of give an arrow here so we know which way it's going. Pardon my mouse drawing. I'm too lazy to grab my tablet, which is sitting on the other side of my desk. Um, then this angle coming out is going to be 40 degrees as well. Now, it's not going to affect... This horizontal impact is not going to affect the speed that it's moving down. It's going to move down at the same rate of speed, but it's going to bounce off that way. It might affect how it rotates, um, or it might not. If it's a quick bounce, you might not notice, or maybe it bounces and it reverses the spin direction. Um, maybe if there's a lot of spin, maybe it does uh, bounce off a little bit more. But keep this in mind. Uh, look at reference videos. I'm not going to demonstrate this too much because I really want you to, to think about it and, and work through the issue. Um, and I'll, I'll do a, a write-up on D2L about that. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I hope this was informative. And then next week, we are going to move into some additional animation using uh, cameras, lights, and talking about constraints, animating along paths, um, animating with kind of targets, uh, and how that can apply to our um, product project that we have going on in the background. So uh, thanks, and uh, good luck.